All right, howdy AP World History students. This lecture is going to focus on imperialism in South Asia, particularly in India. And the lecture is going to address uh, most of the topics, really, of Unit 6 as well. All right, from 6.2 to 6.6, .6, you'll find a little bit of all of that in this lecture. All right, so let's get started. One of the first words to be borrowed from the Hindi language by English speakers was the word loot as in booty or plunder or swag. Recent studies estimate that Britain, through their empire in South Asia, first through the East India Company, and then later through the direct control of the British government, extracted more than 45 trillion, with a T, in money and goods from India during their two centuries of rule there. One of the most legendary items taken by the British was the Kohinoor diamond a massive 700 carat diamond forced out of Indian hands in the signing of a peace treaty and sent to the queen in England. This is the diamond in her crown. It's been cut down to about a hundred something carats, but it is the centerpiece of the crown, right? And one of the larger crown jewels in the Tower of London, although there's larger that they stole from other places. Modern India still makes demands for its return uh, but today it remains on display in the Tower of London as a part of the crown jewels there, with no sign of being returned. This extraction of 45 trillion in wealth is not unique to India. It was, in fact, the purpose and motivation for the new wave of imperialism we've been looking at that spiked between 1750 and the 1900s from across South, Central, East, and West Africa through Central Asia and Southeast Asia. The same story could be told. Corporations, adventurers, shareholders, and the empires themselves were enriched through imperialism. One article I read stated that the British, the British didn't develop India, quite the contrary, India developed Britain with this influx of loot. The power of industrial Europe didn't emerge fully formed with the steam engine and factory, but was built on the raw materials, shady dealings, bloody conquests, and the rapine and plunder that followed. Let's get into that story of the British in India. The British Empire, the British Empire in India grew out of the mercantile business practices of the East India Company. The East India Company had been founded in 1600 and was eventually given a monopoly on all British trade with India for cotton, tea, the opium they would smuggle to China. The EIC, East India Company, was the British authority in India and worked on the behalf of its shareholders and the British government, who were often the same people. Like other European countries in the 16th and 17th centuries, the British EIC gained a foothold in India when they were granted permission by the Mughal emperor there to establish fortifying trading posts and warehouses along the coast of India to store trade goods and haggle for more while they waited for their ships to arrive or depart. Very similar to the empires constructed by the Portuguese in this region around the same time. After the death of Aurangzeb in 1707, one of the last great Mughal emperors, India would have a string of weak, corrupt, and ineffective rulers. In this spiral of decline, many local rulers began to assert their independence from the Mughals, and rival Hindu states like the Maratha Empire rose up to challenge the Mughals for supremacy. The IC took advantage of this weakness and instability to expand its trading post presence and control over regions it already had a presence in. Following victories like the Battle of Plassey in 1747, where, which was fought between East India Company troops and Mughal forces in Bengal with their French allies, the EIC was able to strengthen its position in India enormously by gaining concessions from the Mughals after that victory, such as control of the entire Bengal region and expanse in their trade posts elsewhere. They were granted tax-free trade rights in Bengal, and the right to collect taxes on the land from the populace. They were given governorship of Bengal, essentially. 
That last part's very important. The taxes taken from the Bengalis, for example, were not used to improve India for the most part. Some money went to the construction of railway and roads, but like in other places, the main purpose of this, these roads, railways, was to aid in the British or EIC control of such a large area and help speed the movement of raw goods to the ports or for troops to this issue or that problem. Prior to gaining the right to tax locals, the EIC traded for and purchased their goods from locals, British manufactured goods or other products in exchange for Indian cotton, textiles, opium, or tea. But with their new power to tax, the EIC began setting aside a large portion of the taxes they collected to be used to purchase trade goods and raw materials with. British EIC agents would collect taxes from Bengali peasants one day, and soon after a new agent would come along to buy raw materials off those peasants with their own tax money. And essentially, India paid Britain to take their goods, right? A sneaky little tactic that's pretty typical of corporate maneuvering that helped Britain to rack up that $45 trillion price tag on their swag bag. The EIC from the 1750s on engaged in the outright conquest of India, using military force frequently and diplomacy when possible to continually expand their territory and gain more rights to tax and govern. A series of wars were fought between the EIC and the Mughals, the EIC and the Sikhs, the EIC and Mysore, the EIC and the Marathas of India between the 1760s and mid 1850s. Another very despised method of expanding EIC control over South Asia was the policy known as the Doctrine of Lapse. Basically, this was a policy put in place by the EIC that allowed them to annex, like take full control of, any land under their protection when the legal ruler died without an heir, without a designated heir, right, a son to take over. Or, also, if the EIC decided the current ruler was incompetent, and it was the EIC that got to make such a decision of their incompetence. They used this policy to seize a great deal of territory with the threat of violence on anyone that opposed this policy. So that by 1850, Britain ruled all of India, either directly or through alliances with local Indian princes. And you can see sort of the growth of, of British control in uh, a map like this, as well as those areas that were sort of protectorates or allies, collaborators with the EIC and British forces in the area. The actual British presence in India was relatively small. Only a few thousand British actually resided in South Asia at any given time, maybe sometimes upwards of a couple tens of thousands if you included all the soldiers there. The bulk of the IC's military forces, though, were locals commanded by Europeans. How did such a small force maintain control over such a vast territory? Well, there's a couple different ways. One is the policy sort of invented by the British and imperialists around this time, or at least popularized, known as divide and rule, all right? India is very diverse in linguistics, culture, religion, ethnicities, etc. Um, a rebellion against British imperialism that I'll discuss later in this lecture saw many of these disparate groups of Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs and Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudras, Tamil and Punjab, etc., all band together in united opposition to British rule. After putting down this rebellion, the British actively worked to divide these groups against one another in order to rule them easier. This isn't conspiracy or, you know, liberal teacher talk. This was the legal policy of the EIC and British government in India. The EIC began to reorganize the army and, and the British government after them, first increasing the ratio of British to European soldiers 
um, to local sepoys, as they were called, right? More, they wanted about, you know, one British European guy for every two or three or four Indian sepoy soldiers. But also, they began to split the army according to religion and caste, which had not been the case before this rebellion we're going to discuss earlier. Sikhs and Muslims and Hindus and castes of all kind were mixed together in the same military units. After this united rebellion against British rule, the British began to divide these groups and work to turn them against each other, right, through that segregation and separation. The Sikhs got their own regiments, the Hindus and Muslims got their own military units, even Hindu castes, like I said, were divided into separate military regiments for the Brahmin, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, etc. This division carried over to and was replicated in civil society, not just the military. These strains between caste, between religions, remain in India today, but there are those in India that would argue that wasn't the case prior to the 1850s, when the British put these rules in place, that these groups sure had tensions and problems of Muslim and Hindu under the Mughals, but that many Mughal rulers were mostly secular, that many Mughals participated in Hindu ceremonies and celebrations, and that it's British rule that sort of antagonized this relationship within the subcontinent. British control was also made easier by the large numbers of willing collaborators throughout EIC and British control of the region. Indian businessmen were eager to gain access to the new global economy and traded with the EIC happily and worked to undercut their fellow countrymen for profit with the same zeal as the EIC representatives did. Sepoys, those Indian mercenary soldiers in service to the British, numbered around 200,000 and were absolutely vital to British or East India control of the region. All right, so it's with a couple methods that this relatively small group is able to control such a large area. Sorry. EIC and British rule worked to make India more profitable as a colony. They built many roads and railways linking cities and ports. These railways still benefit India today, but the thing is, India's tax dollars were spent to build them. So the EIC or Britain didn't really give these to India in any sense of the word, but rather forced India to buy trains and build railways imported from Europe, right? Buy it with Indian money, build it with Indian labor, and just not get the know-how, really, about about the construction of those things, right? No train manufacturing companies or whatever established in India, that stuff's imported from Europe. Peasants were often switched from growing food crops to cash crops in an effort to make more money, right? Cash crops being generally things that you, that you don't or can't eat, right? Cotton, opium, tea, coffee, right? Tea and coffee are nice, but they don't really give you any calories, right? It's not crop crops, it's cash crops. Under British rule, India went from an exporter of textiles to an importer of raw cotton. Uh, to an importer of textiles, excuse me. From an exporter of textiles to an importer of textiles. Raw cotton was increasingly grown for export to Britain instead of for local consumption by textile manufacturers in India. That exported cotton would then be resold in markets like India for low prices, further hurting India's craftsmen and textile industries. Opium grown in Bengal through an East India Company monopoly was exported to China before and during the Opium Wars. Policies like this, forcing farmers to switch from growing food for their families to growing drugs to sell and smuggle into China or to grow cotton to send to Britain to be turned into cheap fabrics and resold back to your grandfather that used to make fabric. 
Policies like that led to 7 million Indians dying due to starvation in 1876 and many other famines that would follow due to similar policies of neglect and greed by the EIC and the British government. British manufactured goods were often imported without tariffs, right? Without any taxes that would make them more competitively priced with local goods, further hurting Indian industries in competition with British industries. These policies undermined local production and destroyed local industries. Britain made very little effort to modernize India's manufacturing because that would have made it more competitive with the mother country and less dependent on British goods, making it a smaller colonial marketplace for British stuff. These similar policies, these mercantilist style policies, are part of the reason for the American Revolution that had Britain turned to India as a source of wealth in the first place, right? As a place to rebuild its colonial empire after they lost North America. In essence, India was used as a giant plantation, right? For raw goods to be sent to British manufacturers and then also as a marketplace to resell that stuff. The end result was a process of de-industrialization in India, the reduction and elimination of competitive industries. India accounted for 22% of the global economy during the rule of the Mughals in the 1700s. By the end of British rule, it had been reduced to just 4% of the global GDP. De-industrialized. Another major development and effect of British rule in India was the Indian diaspora that followed. International migration of Indians, Chinese, Japanese, Europeans, and others surged in the industrial era for a number of reasons. Filling the labor void after the end of slavery, for example, led to some 29 million Indians leaving their homeland to work as cheap plantation laborers and miners in British colonies from East Africa to Jamaica. A smaller wave of South Asians made a living as merchants, specifically in British East Africa. In addition to movement within a colony or within a specific colonial empire, large numbers of Asians moved into the colonial world by crossing international boundaries. Some 19 million Chinese, for example, sought a new life in Southeast Asia, the Indian Ocean Basin, the Pacific region. Malaysian rubber plantation and tin mines were staffed primarily with British and some Indian workers. Some of these Asian migrants would be met with racist immigration policies in places like the USA, worried about the yellow peril from Asia. The USA banned immigrants from East and South Asia for a short period starting in the early 20th century with such things as the Chinese or Japanese exclusion acts. So that rebellion I was telling you about um, is known as the Sepoy Rebellion by some people of 1857, or sometimes it's known as the Indian Rebellion. Um, in India, the rebellion is rightly known as the First War of Independence because it wasn't just Sepoys involved, um, but the mass of Indian society that all had one grievance or another against British rule. Many people hurt by British land policies and monopolies, such as the forced cultivation of opium in Bengal and the debt and starvation and loss of land or wealth that followed it, um, were angered. Religious leaders were angered with British policies outlawing traditions like sati, when wives burned with the bodies of their dead husbands. Um, or the British legalizing of remarriage of widows, or of missionaries working to convert the peasant population to Christianity, of pay reductions for soldiers. There were a lot of upset groups, right? Craftsmen and, and weavers and spinners of cloth that had been undercut, pushed out of their professions by British policies, right? A whole lot of very upset people. Lots of rulers that were upset by the doctrine of lapse and other things that had seized their land permanently from them. The immediate catalyst for this rebellion was 
a probably true rumor that new ammo cartridges being issued by the EIC to Hindu and Muslim set boys had been greased in uh, pig or, and cow fat. Um, and this cartridge, you can kind of imagine as a chain of sausage links or something like that, had to be kind of bitten off of this link of other cartridges and then loaded into the rifle, right? And it was sort of greased up so that it would slide down the, the barrel. Um, this meant Hindus and Muslims would have to sort of spiritually violate themselves, right? As they're not allowed to consume beef or, or um, pork, uh, Muslims, pork, Hindus generally don't eat beef. They'd have to sort of spiritually violate themselves to use their weapons as soldiers. Sepoys, upset already about constant attempts at Christian conversion by their British officers, saw this as a manipulative ploy to encourage more conversion to Christianity. Obviously, they were outraged at the change, and some refused to use their rifles with the new ammo. Those that refused were punished harshly for mutiny. This led to the actual mutiny of several Sepoy regiments and quickly led to a general uprising of various groups across India in the First War of Independence. Now, this rebellion is defeated. After about a year of fighting and months and months of back and forth, the British gain several major victories and defeat this, this uprising and go on to rule India until 1947, right? This is not a successful war for independence. The war ends in 1858 with a peace treaty. And the results of that peace treaty lead to Britain officially abolishing the Mughal Empire. The Mughals had jumped in on this uprising as well and tried to sort of reclaim their territories and control of India. The British cast them aside for good, exiled the last emperor to Burma, where he would eventually die in a prison a couple years later. They abolished the East India Company control of India and began to rule India directly through the British government and not through this corporate enterprise. And furthermore, steps were taken to pay off shareholders in the following decade or two and to end the EIC altogether. Um, not that any of that did any good to, to India, but they saw sort of the East India Company's policies, their kind of like out of touchness with the local population um, as being very responsible for this uprising, right? And that they were ignorant kind of of the feeling at the ground level that such an uprising was about to occur. And so for that, they were sort of cast aside, right? And Britain came to rule India directly up until right after World War II. The punishment for a lot of these rebels could be severe, as you see here, guys being executed at point blank range with cannon or hung for mutiny. So to conclude, okay, it's hard to discuss any benefits to imperialism um, because generally we believe today that conquest is wrong, right? If somebody invades your home, shoots members of your family, forces you to work for them for years, but then leaves, but leaves behind a nice new car, a clean house with an extra section they had you build, um, you probably wouldn't feel like you needed to thank them in any way or that they'd done you and your family any benefit by leaving behind this new car and that extra bedroom they added onto your house that they had you build, right? You wouldn't be wondering, did that home invasion, did that actually benefit our family, <laughs> right? Whether it had or hadn't, right? I'm sure being bullied, you know, maybe helps make some people strong, but we generally don't talk about the benefits of bullying, right? So I hate to do that here. It's become an increasingly unpopular um, source of discussion, but it, but it's worth taking a moment to say, were there any benefits of British rule in India? And sure, there were some, right? Do those benefits outweigh the costs? Probably not. Certainly they don't rack up to $45 trillion in benefits, all right? Um, first of all, the idea of nationalism. Just like nationalism was stimulated throughout Europe by Napoleon's forces occupying various countries, 
Nationalism was stimulated in India through the centuries long occupation by this very foreign group of British people. All right. It united a country that had been traditionally for centuries divided. It brought relative peace and stability to a region that had been divided between many competing factions for centuries. Even at the time that the British were there, you had Mughals and Marathas and Sikhs and Mysoreans, right? All engaged in conflict and struggle with one another. This more or less kind of united the subcontinent into one or two major countries. The British left behind a new school system that they developed in India. Um, it served a very small minority, only about 10%, the elite of India, 90% of the country remained illiterate. Um, for the most part, these schools were to train Indians for service in the colonial army or in government bureaucracy. Um, but they did spread the English language so that many Indians are in a very competitive position in the modern global economic arena, right? As being Hindi speakers or, you know, of whatever other Indian language they might speak, as well as English speakers, right? They're, they're primed to get a lot of jobs that you are not. Um, railroads, postal service, and the telegraph were all, in fact, built, although with Indian tax dollars and Indian labor. Nevertheless, they remained in place even after the Brexit from India and helped give India a modest jumpstart after independence or decolonization following World War II. All right. But remember, the, 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 the benefits don't outweigh the costs. And British imperialism in India was a long and bloody one and one we're not quite done talking about. Right. We'll come back to talking about uh, imperialism when we discuss World War One and World War Two and the role of British soldier of, uh, of of Indian soldiers in those conflicts, right? Um, where they, you know, more Indians, you know, die defending Britain in some situations than British people do. Um, hopefully that helps and gives you a good look in a nutshell at British rule in India and imperial and colonial policy there. All right. Um, talk to you guys again soon. Have a good one.